turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. Again, I want to say good morning to you. Good morning to our guests. And certainly uh, good morning to those of, uh, that are watching us on uh, Facebook this morning. Pray everything's going well with them. As I said in my opening, we've got several that are sick. And this time of year, people are on the road uh, traveling, vacations, and what have you. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've got so many that uh, seem to be enduring with um, spiritual warfare. Uh, Satan, listen, Satan's always at work in your life. He's always trying to discourage you. He's always trying to trip you up. And so it's a constant battle. Um, I was listening to a preacher uh, on a sermon this week as I was out walking, and uh, I believe it was maybe Brother Vernon McGee, and he was talking about how that prayer, you know, we like, we like to say these nice, nice little sweet flowery prayers, but he, he said, you know, prayer is, is warfare. Prayer is when you go before the throne of God and you ask him to equip you to defeat the devil in your life. And that it's a, it's a, it's a cry, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleading with God to equip you uh, every single day to uh, win the battle that Satan brings into your, uh, into your home uh, through all kinds of different means. And so we need to be prayer warriors uh, because we have to be warriors in our spiritual lives. Well, you will recall from last week's sermon that Joseph had been summoned by Pharaoh to interpret two dreams that he had had, which none of his magicians or wise men uh, could interpret. The butler, who had been in prison with Joseph uh, two years earlier, remembered that Joseph had this ability to interpret dreams, and so he tells uh, Pharaoh about this, this Hebrew. Uh, Joseph was cleaned up and brought before Pharaoh. And after hearing the dreams, he was able to tell Pharaoh that God was letting him know that there would be seven years of plenty in Egypt, followed by seven years of great famine uh, to the point that it would consume the land. Joseph went on to inform Pharaoh as to how he should approach the coming famine by setting aside 20% of the grain during the years of plenty. I think Joseph was somewhat surprised when, uh, when Pharaoh commented or announced can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Joseph would be the one to oversee the food supplies for Egypt. <clears throat> Joseph was made to be the second in rank in Egypt. In a matter of minutes, perhaps hours, uh, Joseph had ascended from being a prisoner in Egypt to being made the governor of Egypt. We want to take note that throughout Joseph's life, he was an achiever. Wherever he was, at home in Canaan or as a slave or prisoner in Egypt, Joseph was continually elevated uh, to positions with great responsibility. I personally believe that Joseph achieved this because he held a steadfast faith in God's promises and provisions. Joseph had dreamed a dream when he was 17 that indicated that he would uh, one day prosper to the point that his brothers and even his parents would bow down uh, to him. As a slave, he had uh, tremendous confidence that his life was headed towards prominence. Uh, that confidence allowed him to live a God-honoring life that was beneficial to those who held him in captivity, whether the master of the house, Potiphar, or the keeper of the prison. At each stage of his life, God was preparing Joseph for the ultimate role that he would play in God's plan to raise up the nation of Israel. You and I, this morning... As true disciples of Jesus Christ, we too have a promise by God that says we are headed towards a life of prominence. Uh, we are children of the King of Kings, and uh, we are destined towards a home in heaven forever. That promise should be enough to motivate us to live a life that honors God in everything that we do and everything that we say each and every day. I also believe that God prepares his, his truly devoted disciples to help fulfill his plan uh, for his uh, the plan for his kingdom, the fulfillment of his kingdom. We see through the life of Joseph, man, I get excited when I start talking about Joseph. He's just such a, a wonderful example of what a believer has to be in this world. Uh, I love the fact that, uh, you know, when he's 17 years old, he's a young man, and, he, and he's dreaming dreams, and he has these hopes and, and these plans, and, and he has aspirations to do great things because, and in his case, he knows that he's gotten this dream from God uh, himself, and so God has told him that you're going to rise to such prominence that your family is going to bow down to you one day. Now, as a 17-year-old, you might be a little bit prideful and wonder how that would come to uh, fruition and what that actually means in your life, and of course, we know as he told that uh, to his brothers and to his family, uh, all that did was increase their hatred for him, a hatred that took him, uh, took them so far as to, uh, to sell him into slavery 
slavery and send him off into Egypt. And he was dead as far as his father knew because they uh, went as far as to kill a, a kid goat and, and dip his coat of many colors in the blood and bring it back to uh, Jacob and say, is this the coat of your son? Yes, it is. My son's been killed. So Jacob, all these years, he, he believes that his son is, is, is dead and gone. His ten brothers, because Benjamin wasn't there, the ten brothers, they know the truth. They know what they've done. They know the sin that they've committed. Joseph, on the other side of, of, of the fence, so to speak, he's down there in Egypt. He was sold into a slavery. Uh, never once do we read about him uh, having any type of despair or doing anything dishonest. Or he had an opportunity to uh, get back at uh, Potiphar if he wanted to. By uh, you know, He could have slept with his wife as she tried to seduce him day in and day out, as the Bible teaches us. He didn't do that. He rose to a to position where uh, uh, Potiphar trusted him with everything that he had. It said that he trusted him so much that Potiphar didn't even know what he had, except when he would sit down to eat in the evening, and this was, you know, I've got the food in front of me, and I've got the clothes on my back. Joseph didn't allow his circumstances to diminish his faith, his trust, and his service to God. And we need to remember that today. We live in a day and time where, listen, uh, I know particularly right now we're not seeing Christians being crucified uh, along the roadways or, or set out on pikes or anything like that. But I can tell you this, that we're seeing uh, Christians persecuted in this country today. Maybe it's not front page news, so to speak. But we've had believers that have been thrown in prison simply for the witness of Jesus Christ on their lips. We've had uh, business owners put out of business because they wouldn't uh, bake a cake or, or do stationery or something for uh, homosexual uh, weddings. I have no doubt about it. Christians are being persecuted today. I think probably one of the greatest persecutions that we're going through is deception. And can I tell you that deception has always been the greatest tool in Satan's tool belt. By the way, this is all free. I'm not even looking at that. Deception has always been Satan's greatest tool. He started with it in the garden. We were talking a little bit about that this morning, a couple of us. and Adam and Eve were the only two human beings to ever walk this earth that had the ability to not sin. But they were also the first two human beings to have what I've always said is the second greatest gift besides salvation that God gave man, and that's free will. And through their act of free will, they chose to sin. They chose to yield to the pride of life as, as Satan would uh, show them this beautiful fruit and tell them that they would be as God's little G if they would eat of it. And so they yielded to their free will. Joseph, as a slave in Potiphar's house, as a prisoner in Egypt, he never allowed his circumstances to affect his service to God. And that's what we're going to have to see in the church of today. Because I promise you, circumstances are not always going to be to our liking. I can tell you right now, there's some circumstances that are not to my liking in this world. But I can't allow it to, you know, I can't get all uh, disappointed and what have you and quit. Uh, we got people that are lost and dying to go to hell. As I've said to you many, many times, this, this life that we live, this, this belief that we have, this confession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about him. It's about building his kingdom, it's about reaching the lost so that they can come to Christ and, and know what it is to uh, lay down their heads at night and go to sleep, close their eyes and have peace uh, in their hearts knowing that uh, they've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and that there's a future for them, a home in heaven. Seven years of plenty had come, just as Joseph had uh, told uh, Pharaoh the fields yielded such an abundance of crops that 20% that was held back in storage would not only be enough to sustain Egypt through the seven years of famine, but there would be enough to supply the surrounding nations. One of those nations that was hard hit by that famine was Canaan, the land where Jacob and, uh, and the covenant bearer, who was the covenant bearer where he lived. It would be that famine that would eventually drive him and his family into Egypt. Once they were in Egypt, God would transform what would become 70 uh, Hebrew children into the Jewish nation of Israel. 
And can I just point out to you that during that 400 plus years that uh, what was going on, they were slaves and they said that they were made to serve with rigor. And as they did so, they were, uh, they were growing, they were having children, they were multiplying. Uh, they, they multiplied uh, in such a rate that we'll get into here in, a, in probably a few weeks that where uh, when the Pharaoh died, that, that uh, Joseph uh, had died and they, Joseph had faded from memory. The Pharaoh that comes into power, he looks around, he says, man, these Hebrew children are growing too fast. We've got to do something about them. We need to make slaves out of them. The entire time that they were enslaved, the entire time that they were being beaten, the entire time that they were uh, made to serve with rigor, God was turning them into the nation of Israel. God was fulfilling his promise in their lives, each and every one of them. And I would say the same to you, that no matter what's going on in your life, as a child of God, you have promises from God, and he is fulfilling those promises in your life. As I pointed out throughout our study of Joseph, God has orchestrated every detail in his life and in all the lives that intersected with his to culminate in the fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant. This is important for us to understand. The Abrahamic covenant has not yet been completely fulfilled. God promised land to Israel, and not all of that land has been received, not yet anyway. As I've read and I've studied and as we've gone through Genesis, what I've learned is that at the height of Israel's uh, prominence, they claimed about uh, 30,000 uh, square miles, and God has promised them something like 300,000 square miles, a tenth of what he has promised them. So when we see what's going on in the world today, when we see what's going on in, in Israel and the surrounding nations, and, and listen, the thing that keeps coming to my thought is, uh, have, you, have you gone and looked at Israel on a world map? Have you gone and looked at it? you got to blow that thing up to where you can even find it, just a little dot right there. And the whole world is focused on what's going on in that little piece of territory. Why? Why are they so concerned? Why is Russia concerned? You go look at them, Russia's con looks like they got it all. China, Iran, Iraq. But they're worried about this little, little dot of a country over here. Because God's plan is still at work. We're seeing it before our very eyes. I know sometimes it can be a little disconcerting, but it's also exciting. So as we're reading about God's sovereign will being exercised in the affairs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we can fully trust that God's sovereign will continues to be exercised in the lives of people today. Each and every day, God's plan continues to play out in the direction of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to claim his bride, to bring the Jews to repentance, and to establish a new heaven and a new earth in the eternity to come. As we finished reading chapter 41 last week, we saw that all countries were coming to Egypt to see Joseph in order to buy corn. That brings us to chapter 42. We're looking at Bible prophecy, which is the story of Jesus Christ. We've been looking at Yosef, and this morning I want to preach a message entitled Yosef, From Tested to Testing. If you would, stand with me for just a couple minutes here. We're going to read a few verses beginning in verse 1 of chapter 42. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not it with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's uh, brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you this morning. and we, we love your word. We love what your word reveals to us. <clears throat> we
We thank you for the life of Joseph, for the example that he sets before us. Lord, as we learn more about your word, more about you, may we love you more and more with all our heart, mind, souls, and strength. Lord, and may that love and that devotion encourage us and, and help us to persevere through times of darkness in our life as we go through periods of where life is just, just so challenging that we just don't know what to do. We thank you for loving us and equipping us, Lord, for the battle that lays ahead of us. Help us to be faithful to the call on our lives, Lord, to serve you, to honor you with our lives. And we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> As we begin to read in verse 1, we find that there has been seven years of plenty, and now the famine was throughout the land, and the impact of the famine was affecting uh, uh, Jacob's family. Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, so he sent his sons down there to buy food for their family. But in verse 3, we read that he didn't send all his sons. In verse 3, it says, And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. Jacob had twelve sons. He believed that his favorite son, Joseph, the firstborn to Rebekah, uh, the love of Jacob's life, was dead. Joseph's only full brother, Benjamin, was not sent into Egypt because their father feared that mischief might fall upon him. One gets the sense in reading about this family that Jacob doesn't trust his sons born to his first wife, uh, Leah, and the handmaids Zilpah and Bilhah. He would have taken notice as to how those boys hated his son Joseph and how now that Benjamin was his preferred son, <clears throat> perhaps they hated him too. Maybe. Just maybe, Jacob was suspicious about the true circumstances concerning uh, Joseph's presumed death. I think that, as you recall when we read initially about Joseph, I believe it was in chapter 37, that his brothers hated him and said that they didn't speak a civil word to him. <clears throat> Their father would have noticed that. Remember the situation here that, that Jacob had served uh, 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 Leah and, and uh, Rebekah's father seven years thinking he was going to get to marry uh, Rebekah and, then he, and he, uh, the father pulled the switch and so he ended up with Leah and they had to work another seven years for Rebekah, but Rebekah was the one that he loved. And then there's two handmaids in there. So he has all these children and he's got, you know, the first uh, one to have four by Leah, and then uh, the next uh, two by um, uh, uh, Rebecca's handmaids, Bilhah, and then the next uh, couple from Leah's uh, handmaid, Zilpah, and then a couple more with Leah, and then the last two, Joseph and Benjamin, were born to the woman, Raquel, that he, that he loved with all his heart. And so these were his favorite sons. And so we see that playing out. I think that Jacob maybe was becoming, uh, had become suspicious about what truly would have happened to his, his preferred son, his favorite son. In verse 5 it says, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now we don't know for sure how long at this point we're into the famine uh, before it forced uh, Jacob and his family to go search for supplies. Maybe it was six months, maybe it was a year, maybe more. Uh, I mean, for sake of conversation, we'll say a year. The people that were coming from the surrounding nations would have had to buy their supplies from Joseph. You'll remember that when uh, the famine uh, first hit, that Pharaoh, when the people began to cry out, he said, you go see Joseph and, and you do what he tells you to do. And so we know these people that were coming from all over uh, that Joseph was overseeing. And I don't think he was standing at the counter necessarily uh, dispatching you know, sacks of corn or whatever. Uh, but I do think he was overseeing it. He was probably a prominent figure within that marketplace or wherever they were doing this distribution. So when Joseph's brothers arrived in Egypt, Joseph was then the governor, but they did not recognize him. Keep in mind that Joseph was 17 the last time that they saw him. He was 30 when he stood uh, before Pharaoh, according to Scripture. 
there's now been seven years of plenty had transpired, and, and now they're at least a, maybe a year or so into the famine. That would make Joseph a minimum of 38 years of age, 21 long years since their brothers had seen him. In verse 6, And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. So here we have a Bible prophecy fulfilled, literally fulfilled. Remember Joseph's dream in Genesis 37-7 where he and his brothers were binding sheaves of grain and his sheaf, his sheaf stood up and his brother's sheaves all bowed down uh, before him. And you remember how angry they got and it just, it just fed the coals of hatred even hotter. On that day, this day that we're reading about, his brothers bowed to him. They didn't know it was Joseph, but Joseph knew it was them. And he knew that God's word had been fulfilled just as he had trusted all the days of his captivity. I think in that moment that it had to be a tremendously emotional moment for Joseph. First, he gets to see his brothers after 21 years, and then he witnesses God's word coming into fruition and to have touched him, it had to have touched him very deeply. Are you and I touched deeply when God's word is fulfilled in our lives? We should be. We need to be. I fear that many professing Christians today, their faith is weak because they don't know what God's promised uh, uh, to them. We're unable to take an account of God's faithfulness because we don't know what he's promised us. We kind of get up, we go about our business, we show up to church on, on Sundays and uh, we hear a message or we sit in a Sunday school class or whatever the case may be and then we kind of just live our lives. But understand that Joseph has just gone through 13 years of, of, of deep testing, if you will, while in um, Egypt as a slave in Potiphar's house and then as a prisoner in, in the prison of Egypt. And I personally believe that what sustained him each and every moment of those days, each morning when he arose, what sustained him was, will this be the day that I rise to prominence because God told me I would? And so that was why he lived each and every day of his life in a way that would honor God because he trusted what God told him would come about to be. And here we are. The brothers are bowing to him. They don't know that they're bowing to Joseph. They think it's, you know, the governor of Egypt is all they know. But Joseph knows. And in that moment, I don't know if they said amen, but listen, I think in his heart he was shouting amen. It's been a long, long time, but God's truth is before me. I quote it to you all the time, Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. These things referring to the necessities of life that he had talked about previously, our food, our shelter, our clothing, and what have you. So can I say to you that if you woke up this morning, which I'm assuming you did because you're here, I don't see anybody nodding off yet, but I'm watching. God's watching, all right? Each and every morning when we, when we awake, we're seeing the fulfillment of God's promise in our life. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and he will give you the provisions that you need for the day, for, the, for your life. You got up, you got dressed, you put on the clothes, the provisions of God. You, you woke up in a bedroom with a roof over your head, the provisions of God. You went out and you had breakfast or coffee or whatever you do in the morning, the provisions of God. You went to work, you came home. The provisions of God. Every single day of our life, we witness the fulfillment of God's promise to us. Every day. And that should put a smile on our face. That should bring peace within our hearts. And that truth should help us to sustain us, to persevere through no matter what the trials that we may face. Every day, we experience God's faithfulness. And that is something that we can bank on. What a tremendous, tremendous thing.
Joseph had endured those 13 years at the initiation of his brothers when they threw him into the pit and sold him into slavery. What we begin to see here is that now Joseph, he's going to begin to test his brothers, not out of revenge, mind you, but he's trying to determine if there's been a change in their hearts. Verse 9, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land you are come. This accusation of being spies is certainly a serious one. This phrase, to see the nakedness of the land, was a reference to their uh, making a reconnaissance of Egypt to discover their vulnerabilities. It was meant to strike fear into their hearts, because, and it certainly it did, because what it meant was, as Joseph is saying, is, you're here to destroy us. I will destroy you before I allow you to destroy Egypt. The brothers understood what the implications were, and they were fearful. And in verse 10, they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food <clears throat> are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. The brothers begin to refute Joseph's accusation, and they begin to tell of their family background as a means to try to calm his fears that they were there to spy on the land. During their conversation, you may have noticed that they claimed that they were all brothers, and that youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. That phrase, one is not, is a reference to one that is dead. It's an obvious reference to their brother, Joseph. It makes you wonder if the brothers, after 21 years, had bought into this idea that Joseph was indeed dead. Or was it just a way to account for their brother without uh, indict them for the sin that they had committed? In verse 14, And Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies." And he put them all together into ward three days. Think about what Joseph has done here. He has falsely accused his brothers as spies. I read that and I thought, hmm, makes me wonder if he wanted to give them a taste of what life is like to be confined due to a false accusation. Perhaps Joseph wanted to see how they would conduct themselves under such circumstances. He was testing their character, their resolve during a stressful situation. Understand that you and I are going to go through various uh, circumstances in our life that may be stressful. And when we do, I think that, I've, I've said to you many, many, many times, I think that God gives us opportunities to define our faith. And by that, what I mean is that when we get into a circumstance, a situation that is uncomfortable, that is stressful, whether or not we're going to continue to trust in him or if we're going to uh, trust in man, or maybe we're going to do something uh, dishonoring to him in, toward, in order to try to relieve our, um, our circumstances to make us more comfortable. Remember, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about God. Think about this for just a second. If God were to use you in your life in a manner that brought great despair to you, great pain, but he used it in such a way that you were able to maintain your faith in him, that you were able to praise his name through all kinds of of darkness. But as a result of your testimony, there were hundreds come to Christ. Would you not want to endure that? I trust that you would. I find it interesting that he put them into ward or prison for three days. 
were the three days representative of the three years minimum that we know that he was in prison? Maybe he said, well, I'm going to give you a day for each year that I was in so you can see what it's like. Or, or and this is just me thinking out loud, or was the three days representative of the eternal life that would be made available by a risen Jesus after three days in the grave? Because he's going to bring them out of the prison. He's going to give them uh, the the qualifications for life. Joseph is going to give them a chance to live if they meet his conditions. Then Joseph has a slight change of heart. In verse 18, And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. It's an interesting statement by Joseph. He was living in Egypt. Egypt certainly was a polytheistic culture. They worshiped many gods, and here he confesses his fear of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Perhaps it was meant to be a clue. Maybe not. Maybe uh, during his profession of, of faith in God, he just got carried away and it slipped out. But maybe that was a hint to them that that's odd for the governor of Egypt to press, profess faith or fear in, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once again, we see Joseph as living as a living example of what would become New Testament wisdom uh, in his in this instance. And and we look at Romans twelve seventeen, where Paul wrote, "Recompense to no man evil for evil; provide things honest in the sight of all men." We can't. We're not allowed. We're not permitted. It should no longer be a part of our makeup, our character. That when someone sins against us, when someone treats us ill, that we respond in like manner. Somebody offends you, it doesn't open the door, nor does it give you permission to respond in a manner that you can be mean to them, that you can be rude or hurtful. I know the, the human tendency is to, to lash out. Someone hurts us, we want to hurt them. We want to get even. We want our pride to be satisfied. God says that that's not, that's not in our tool belts. Joseph had reconsidered his plan to test his brothers. And instead of allowing one to return to Canaan to bring Benjamin back, he kept one and allowed the remaining nine to return. I personally think that his reasoning for this was that by allowing nine to return, that uh, they could certainly take nine times more uh, food supplies back to his family or their families in Canaan. Joseph was providing for his brothers and their families long before they had repented of their sin of selling him into slavery. Our Father in heaven did the same for us. Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, maybe you're sitting here today you're not a born-again believer. You've never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But he's providing for you. You're here. You're breathing. You're, you're walking. You're talking. Jesus Christ didn't come to the cross with a tally sheet. He didn't go to his father and say, well, Father, if I, if I do this, not everybody's going to get saved, so what's, what's the use? We know that the Bible says, you know, broad is the, the way to, to hell, but narrow is the way, and straight is the gate. And so Jesus died for those that would be willing to walk that way and enter that gate. That's a tremendous gift. Verse 19 says, If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. So Joseph gives them the requirement that must be met in order to avoid death. Then the brothers engage in a conversation. During that conversation, Reuben, the eldest brother, reminds them that he had warned them not to harm Joseph. And now he reasoned Joseph's blood was going to be required of them in verse 21. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, spake I not unto you saying, do not sin against the child and ye would not hear. Therefore behold also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. 
understand what, what Reuben is saying here. What they're, what they're acknowledging here is that when Joseph was down in that pit, the, what I see uh, through the language of Scripture is, is that these brothers were standing around the, the edge of that pit, and they were looking down at him, and Joseph was crying out from the bottom of that pit to, to free him, to release him, to let him go back home to dad, uh, to return to him his coat of many colors. And so they, they just looked at him, and we know from reading before that they just went over, sat down, and began to eat. The Scripture says that they saw they saw the anguish of his soul. They hated him that much. Since their arrival, Joseph hasn't made himself known to them. He hasn't said, hey, brothers, it's me. He hasn't done that. He's, he's, he's spoken to them in Egyptian or whatever. He had an interpreter. So they felt comfortable to have this conversation in his presence because they thought he didn't know what they were saying. But understand that something's happening here. In verse 24, and he turned, he being Joseph, he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. It says that Joseph wept. He wept because he's, he's seeing repentance among his brothers for their evil deed committed so many years earlier. He wept because he truly desired to show them mercy, to care for their needs and the needs of his father and the brother back home. Verse 25, then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into a sack and to give them provision for the way, and thus did he unto them. So we see here Joseph's mercy at work. He not only returns the money they, they brought to pay for the food, uh, we read here that he instructed his servants to give them provision for the way. Now, Joseph didn't have the advantage of possessing a New Testament to guide him in his daily walk with the Lord, but we again, uh, as we do so many times, we see Scripture living in him. Romans 12, 20 and 21, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I would argue that God has done the exact same thing for you and me today. He has given us provision for the way. As we live each and every day of our lives, God provides for us to, uh, to make our way home to him in heaven. God's mercy is manifested in so many ways in all our lives, and we need to be uh, aware of that and accounting of that each and every day of our lives. Joseph could have very easily, if he had imprisoned his brothers, put him to death, and that would have been the end of the story. But understand, it's not about Joseph. It's not about his revenge. It's not about his gratification of, of, of revenge. It's about God's plan of redemption for you and me, by the way. He's going to take this family, send them into Egypt, grow a nation, and through that nation and through those people, the Messiah would come, the Messiah would be put to death, the Messiah would rise again, and then through the shed blood of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, we can know eternal life. What a, what a game plan we're seeing executed before our eyes, and it's so detailed, and it's so, uh, the minutia of it is amazing. Verse 26, And they laded their asses with the corn and departed thence, and as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the end, he espied his money for, behold, it was in his sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? We see an awakening of conscience among the brothers. Their, position, their possession of the money could certainly have been construed by Joseph and his officers as theft, which would have been a, a death sentence for him. Certainly they were afraid because their lives were literally at stake. But notice what they said in regard to their situation. What is this that God hath done unto us? They are convinced that their dilemma is a judgment from God himself for their sin of selling Joseph into slavery so many years earlier. Remember, they haven't recognized Joseph yet. God has brought this thing to pass. This is the working of God. 
But understand when, when, when the brother, we're not told which one, opened up the sack and he's going to feed his, his mule and he sees the money there, he panics because, oh no, this was money that I had brought to pay uh, uh, Pharaoh, uh, the, uh, the governor of Egypt, Joseph, and, and I haven't done that and now it's here and, and they could accuse me of stealing and I could be put to death. They believe that it's a judgment by God and that God's judgment is death. But that's not what God is doing. That's not what God is doing at all. Are they scared? Yes, they're scared. But that fear has brought them to the realization that there is a judgment by God. And we need to repent of the things that we've done. This is because of what we did to our brother Yosef. Can I tell you something? Maybe there's sin in your life. And maybe there's been consequences. And you think that God's just out to destroy you. God's not into the judgment of destroying you. God's in the judgment, in the, in the business of saving you. He's trying to get you, I think, I think what God does is he gets us to the end of ourselves. When the power that we have, that we believe we have, because we really have none, when we no longer uh, are able to fix whatever is broken in our lives, and fear fills our heart, now we want to look at God and say, God, forgive me. Show me the way. Help me. When the brothers arrived home, they told their father everything that had transpired, especially about having to leave Simeon and and the need to take Benjamin with them if they're going to go back to Egypt. And in verse 33, And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me, then shall I know that ye are no spies. But ye are true men, so will I deliver you, your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. And it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. When they began to unpack the sacks, uh, not only was there one brother who had his money, but all the bundles of money were there in each of the brother's sacks. At this point, they feared because they believed that they had been set up, that it had been a a scheme to, uh, to cost them their lives. Was God behind all this? Yes. Yes, but not to their destruction. Look at Jacob's response. Remember now that Jacob is now the bearer of the Abrahamic covenant. He's a wealthy man. He has at least 13 children. He's got land. He's got herds of uh, goats, sheep, cattle, whatever. And in verse 36, And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. Simeon is not. And you will take Benjamin away? All these things are against me. Jacob says, all these things are against me. What he's saying is, all these evils fall back upon me. The loss of his sons had become a heavy burden, and that was hastening Jacob's death. He was full of despair. Despair, uh, despite his fortunate existence, Jacob had become discouraged because of life's circumstances. Listen, Jacob had everything. Wealth, power, influence, whatever. Because of the loss of his favorite son, Yosef, now Simeon. We don't really know why Yosef kept Simeon back, but he did. There's some ideas about that. And now the requirement to take Benjamin back if they want to see him again. Jacob says it's too much. It's too much for me to bear. It's killing me. How many of us either are or have or surely will be going through something that's going to feel like it's killing me? It's absolutely killing me. How can I endure this? 
I'll tell you how you endure this. By walking faithfully with an almighty God. God is working in Jacob's life. He's always been. Jacob has not yet learned the truth that his son Joseph was experiencing in Egypt. And I'll share with you again Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called, who are the called according to his purpose. Jacob had indeed been called according to God's purpose from the day that he stole his brother's uh, Esau's birthright to the day that he fled to Padanaram throughout his time serving his uncle Laban uh, to the day he received the horrifying news that his beloved uh, son had perished to this day when his sons returned from Egypt and bring more heartbreaking news. Jacob doesn't know that in a very short time he's going to see all of his sons again and he will again rejoice with a full heart. Verse 37, And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee, deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which he go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. I don't understand Reuben's comment here. I don't understand what's going on, to be honest with you. Was it just hyperbole? I hope so. I just, I just can't imagine, I don't understand how Jacob could be comforted in any way, under any circumstances, by seeing two of his grandsons put to death. I don't understand that part. Look closely, though, at verse 38. And we begin to see more of this, uh, these weird family dynamics uh, in Jacob's household. Notice that Jacob refuses to allow his son, Benjamin, to go back into Egypt as a means to rescue his older half-brother, Simeon. On top of that, the first thing that pops in my mind, well, aren't they all his sons? Shouldn't he have this same concern for the others? He goes even further when he says that if Benjamin fell into mischief, then that ye shall bring, uh, uh, shall ye bring me down my, my hair, uh, gray hairs with sorrow to the grave? He's, it's an obvious reference to the greater love that he had for this, this youngest son, but most importantly, his only surviving son, as far as he knew, that had been born to the love of his life, Raquel. This is a dysfunctional family. But remember, listen to me now, this is important. Isaac's household was dysfunctional, as was Abraham's household. God's great promise to make Abraham a great nation was in full force. But I want us to see clearly how that God used and still uses very imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will. It is sad to find anyone who believes that they are unredeemable because of their flaws. We're all flawed. Man has been flawed since the Garden of Eden. And God knew all these things would transpire. That is the very reason he sent his only son Jesus into this world to die for the sinful and flawed people that would walk this earth. Jesus came so that you could go. Go to heaven to be with him and the Father for all eternity. I truly believe that Jesus is going to come again real soon. I believe that. I'm not just saying that. But that's something you preachers say. No, I believe it. I believe what we're seeing and what we're reading, what we're studying, it indicates that he's coming. I believe what the Bible says. The Bible says he's coming again. He said in John 14 uh, that I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I believe that. And the other things that I read, I look around what's going on in the world, and what I find is I, I find that I believe that we are in the last of the last days. Now, I know they've been saying that for 2,000 years. Biblically, we have been in the last days since Jesus arose from the grave. Biblically. I would tell you we are in the last of the last days. We are seeing things take place in, around the world and, and certainly specifically within Israel that are indicators that time is growing short. 
I've been so excited about studying in Joseph and, and encouraged by his life to see that all the things, the, the horrible things that he's endured, the loneliness, the fear, and that his trust and his unwavering faith in the promise of God that it sustained him every day of his life. And what I would say to each and every one of us, we need to trust in God, to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So that no matter what goes on in your life, no matter what loss you may endure, no matter what pain you might encounter, no matter what the obstacles seem to be in your, in your path of this life, that you know that God's got a plan for you. He's got a reward for you in heaven waiting for you. Every day, I think, that we live on this earth, God is growing us, modeling us, preparing us for that day when we step into the kingdom with him. That's the whole plan. That's the whole plan. As I've said to you many times, we're going back to plan A. Plan A was the Garden of Eden that supplied all the needs of man. And we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth one day. Again, this is just me thinking out loud. My opinion, I look forward to walking around on that new earth and reaching over. I want to pat a lion on the head and not worry about losing a hand. I, I just believe that that's what we're going back to because that was God's desire for us in the beginning. He gave us a chance to embrace that, and man didn't. But you and I can embrace it today by expressing our faith and love for him and living for him every day. Don't let pride, don't let despair, don't let anger, bitterness separate you from the love of God. There's no, there's no payday in that. There's no benefit in that. Love the God that loves you and that has a, a tremendous reward waiting for you in heaven. Hi, I'm Pastor D, and I pastor Truth Freeville Baptist Church right here in uh, Titusville, Florida at 5311 Barna Avenue. And I just want to take a moment to let you know what's going on in 2024 here at the church. I uh, just felt like the Lord has led us to want to focus on Bible prophecy this year. Uh, so we're starting with uh, in our Sunday school, our adult Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, Brother Warren Linton is going to be uh, teaching the book of Genesis. And we just feel that it's important for people to have a good uh, understanding of that as a good foundation for their understanding of the Word of God in, in totality. Uh, next, on Thursday evenings at 6.30, Brother John Neese is teaching on uh, end times prophecy. And again, with everything that's going on in the world, we just think that there's probably a, a big interest in that. So uh, we'd like to invite you to come and be a part of that with us. And then on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., uh, I'll be preaching Bible prophecy from the pulpit. And we're going to be focusing on both the uh, messianic prophecies, those that have been uh, foretelling the, the coming of Jesus and his first coming. And then certainly uh, we will follow that up with uh, prophecies that tell about his second coming when uh, we rapture out the church and uh, the seven years of tribulation. And then when uh, Jesus comes back to set up his millennial kingdom. So we just want to let you know that that's what's going on here. If you have an interest in these topics, we'd love to have you come and join us again Sunday uh, mornings at uh, 9 a.m. for Sunday school, uh, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for worship, and then, of course, Thursday nights at 6.30 p.m. for the adult Bible study uh, where we're looking at end-time prophecy. Uh, again, I pray that uh, you could uh, come and be a part of this. We'd love to meet you and have you to come out and be a part of our church family. Thank you.